Hi, you guys. Erin here. I am back with another moon update for you. Today, I'm going to be talking about the lunar eclipse we have coming up here on Monday, March 25th. Now, anytime we have a lunar eclipse, we have to be having a full moon. So this is a full moon, south node, lunar eclipse in the sign of Libra. And that full moon peaks at exactly 12 a.m. Pacific time on Monday, March 25th. So for some of you who are behind Pacific time, this is actually happening on March 24th. Now, what I'm going to do in this recording is I'm going to break down how to work with this energy. Really, really interesting stuff. It's like basically this is the lunar eclipse. It's kind of like opening the gates to this eclipse energy. And then two weeks from now on April 8th, we'll be having a total solar eclipse in the sign of Aries. That one's going to be really, really wild. But this is really powerful stuff. I mean, eclipses are extremely powerful. It's like full moons are always powerful, of course. It's like when we're all most sensitive to each other's energy, the moon, she rules over our intuition and our moods and our emotions. And so when she's in her fullest form, we all become a little more sensitive, whether we're aware of it or not, we all become a little more sensitive for some people more than others. Okay. And when it's a lunar eclipse, again, it has to be a full moon if we're having a lunar eclipse, but uh, full moons are strong. But when it's a lunar eclipse, it's even it's even more powerful. It's so, so, so powerful. This energy that we're receiving, a lot of people will be like, eclipses are no big deal. Nothing ever happened to me on the day of an eclipse. It usually doesn't happen on the day of an eclipse. It's usually what an eclipse does is it's either going to bring something into your life or take something away from your life. And since this is a south node lunar eclipse, it really is about releasing something. It's like something is being taken out of our lives through this eclipse. And it usually happens within two weeks before the eclipse or two weeks after the eclipse or sometimes 90 days after an eclipse, sometimes 180 days after an eclipse, sometimes 120 days after an eclipse. That's all based on aspects in astrology. It just depends on how it's hitting your own personal natal chart. But we all experience it as a collective uh, in, in some way, shape or form. I, I mean, if you've got something really strong in your natal chart near five degrees Libra, that's where this full moon peaks then this is an extremely, extremely powerful eclipse for you. Okay, so what I'm going to do in this recording is I'm going to break down how to work with this energy and I'm going to break down the sign of Libra because it's like, because it's a full moon, it is the peak of a growth cycle, okay? It's like the end of this cycle. It's the ending, okay? Because about six months ago, we had a new moon in the sign of Libra. Over these six months, we've all been experiencing this opportunity for growth. It's related to the sign of Libra. So as soon as this full moon peaks, that is the completion of that cycle. Now, with that said, as the moon keeps continuing to move forward, so she peaks at one, uh, sorry, 12 a.m. Pacific time on Monday, March 25th, she's in her fullest form. And then all of a sudden, she starts to wane. She starts to get smaller within seconds after that full moon. That's when we want to let go of any of this Libra energy we may have picked up on that's not serving us. And this is extremely powerful because what's going to happen is um, later that evening, it's around 9.30 p.m.-ish Pacific time on Monday, March 25th, the moon will transit right over the south node. Okay, now that south node is like a drain point that takes things away. So be thinking, be, as I'm breaking down the sign of Libra for you, be thinking about like how have you grown in these ways? Libra is such a wonderful, charming energy. It's definitely one of my favorite signs of the zodiac. I've always been very drawn to Libra risings. Um, so how have we grown in these ways that are related to the sign of Libra? Because that's something, you know, to give yourself some honor for, but honoring your own growth related to the sign of Libra but also be thinking about, okay, what do I need to let go of that's not serving me with this Libra energy? Okay, so I'll break down the sign of Libra for you. I will also be talking, I'll pull up the chart and we'll talk about some other very prominent astrological forces we are receiving at the time of this lunar eclipse. And I'll say this right now, I've been looking at the chart thinking to myself, okay, just imagine that this is a human, like this is you know somebody's natal chart. What would this person be like? And first of all, I think they'd be very, very strong-willed. Um, not that the sign of Libra is strong-willed, but we've got a ton of Aries energy going on, and Aries is certainly strong-willed. I also feel that this human would be um, 
very naturally spiritually tapped in with Venus and, and Saturn and um, Mars and Pisces, we, we, Neptune and Pisces, a, Pi, a bunch of Pisces energy going on. And then we've got a little Taurus energy going on, which would generally be described as something that could ground this person out a little bit. However, what's going through Taurus is Uranus, which is not grounded. Uranus, uh, Jupiter is also going through Taurus, but we'll get into this. But at least we've got a little Earth energy going on. That sign of Taurus is our, is our saving grace for this lunar eclipse is it's the only Earth energy we're receiving through any kind of celestial bodies. And then... I also feel like this person may deal with a little bit of depression. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that the moon, the full moon is so close to the south node. A lot of times when people are born with their moon next to the south node, they can deal with uh, certain times in their life where they have to kind of deal with some severe depression. Okay. So that's something to be thinking about, you know, in days surrounding this transit. Of course, we all experience this lunar eclipse as a collective, but it's also incredibly unique to each and every one of us. And so much of this depends on your own natal chart. Do you have anything in the sign of Libra? Do you have anything between, say, 14 and 4 degrees Libra in your natal chart? If so, then this is a really, really, this, this eclipse is hitting your chart really, really hard, okay? But also, I mean, we all have the sign of Libra somewhere in our natal chart, whether or not we have any planets or celestial bodies in the sign of Libra, uh, maybe your Libra rising or whatever, but it's for all of us. We all have every single zodiac sign in our natal chart somewhere. And this could be coming through your, your house of relationships, your house of career, your house of money, your house of karma, your house of communication, your house of higher learning, your house of transformation, all these different areas of your life that this could be coming through. If you're a little bit familiar with your natal chart, or if you've had a reading with me, you can go back and review the video recording to see which area of your life this is specifically activating for you. But of course, if that's too much for you, if you're somebody who's never seen a natal chart before, you know, I would say I take a step back and, and just focus on the sign of Libra in and of itself. You might even be able to be intuitive, intuitive enough to be able to figure out which area of your life this eclipse is activating. Okay, so I'm also going to be talking about certain parts of the body that are ruled by the sign of Libra because these parts of our body become more sensitive really any time the moon transits through the sign of Libra. Um, really, anytime anything transits through the sign of Libra, but when we have a south node lunar eclipse in the sign of Libra, it is definitely a good idea to pay a little extra attention to these parts of our bodies. Uh, so of course, I'll be mentioning some potential herbal remedies to help support these parts of our body. And I will also be talking about gemstones that resonate well with the sign of Libra. What I've been doing for so many years now, anytime we have a full moon, I pull out my journal, I write down the growth that I'm grateful for that's related to the sign the moon is transiting through, and I write down what I want to let go of. And you better believe I'll be doing that with a lot of intention for this one because it's so powerful as that moon's going to transit over the south node. But also, I like to take a few gemstones that resonate well with the sign the moon is transiting through or just the overall astrological forces and put them on top of my journal. And then I'll put that journal up on a windowsill or up on the fireplace mantle or what, whatever you, you, know, you got going on at home. But this is something I've been doing for so many years now. I wouldn't continue to do it if I didn't see such incredible results coming from it. Now, I always leave a full extensive list of stones that resonate well with the sign the moon is transiting through in the description below. But please do not feel like discouraged or that you're missing out on something if you don't have any of these gemstones. We work with what we've got when it comes to this kind of lunar magic. And if you want to manifest more gemstones into your life, a new moon is definitely an ideal time to be doing that. This is the full moon. This is the peak of the growth cycle. Okay, so the sign of Libra. This is what we call the cardinal air sign. And when I say cardinal, what I'm talking about is a force that comes through, okay? All the cardinal signs, Aries, Libra, Capricorn, and Cancer, they all, the cardinal means that they're, that's a season or the beginning of a new season, okay? Libra being cardinal, that's the, Libra is is the, when we change seasons and go into fall or autumn, okay? But that's when the sun moves into the sign of Libra, but we're talking about the moon is in the sign of Libra. But still, it comes with a certain kind of force. Now, Libra is not a forceful 
energy. I just want to make myself very clear here. Like when somebody who's a true Libra who really carries the Libra qualities is not going to be a forceful person. They're actually going to be pretty chill, pretty laid back, pretty balanced, level-headed kind of person. Uh, but how I see the cardinal energy come through the sign of Libra is when it comes to introducing themselves. Okay. The sign of Libra it's, it's the sign of partnerships. I'll get deeper into this, but it's like the sign of, of you sharing your energy with another person. And I can't tell me, tell you how many times I've been able to, you know, ask somebody, are you Libra? And I go, yes, I'm a Libra because they're the person, you know, let's, this has happened so many times where I've been like at a, a social uh, gathering, an event of sorts, and I don't know anybody there. So I'm just kind of standing around by myself. And somebody comes up to me and will be like, hi, I'm so-and-so, nice to meet you, and reach out their hand and introduce themselves. And not in any kind, like a Leo could do that. But a Leo is more like, hey, look at me. <laughs> Libra is more like just they're not there's they do well in social settings and they can come up and that's what i'm talking about that cardinal energy just sticking their hand out hi it's nice to meet you it's a very very charming energy now in the element of air this is it, it is an intellectual energy all the air signs libra gemini and aquarius are all associated with intellect and libra is in a different way see gemini the motto for Gemini is I think it's a super hyper intellectual energy. And then for Aquarius, the motto is I know. Okay. Uh, the uh, sign of Aquarius is like the, the genius of the, the Zodiac. Now, those are the other two air signs. Libra is not like hyper intellectual. Libra is more like the kind of uh energy where somebody, if they were again, like true Libra energy, there's somebody who could just go to public school turn their work in on time. They just do their homework. Da, da, da. This is this is what we do in life. And then we turn in our homework and get the, we get a B or a, you know, a minus or whatever. It's not super crazy brainiac kind of energy, but just, it's like intellectual and being logical about things, making sense of things. Libra is represented by the scales. And the motto is I balance. It's all about balancing things out. You might want to be thinking about that with this kind of transit, like especially balancing out your emotions, which may be a little bit difficult with the South Node conjunct the moon. So it's if there if your emotions are feeling imbalanced. This would be a good time to let go of the part that's, you know, heavier, the part that's not allowing for things to be balanced. Okay, now Libra is ruled by Venus, which Venus is like the is often referred to as a planet of love. But I think of Venus as the influencer of love and relationships and harmony and things that are aesthetically pleasing, art, poetry. Um, Venus is this very harmonious, relaxing energy, okay? And the sign of Libra can be very harmonious and relaxing kind of energy. Now, in fact, the sign of Libra, sometimes Libra people can be a little bit lazy. Um, certainly not all of them. I know plenty of very, very productive Libras and Libras are at Libra risings, but the sign of Libra actually represents when the sun is setting, okay? If we picture the Zodiac, Here's the sign of Libra. Here's the sign of Aries. They're opposite each other. Well, Aries, the time of day that's related to the sign of Aries is when the sun first rises. Okay. Aries is like, let's go kind of energy. And the sun goes over the sky. And then the sun, when it's um, the sun is setting, that's the sign of Libra. Libra is more like, let's go watch a sunset. Let's sit back and relax and you know, have a glass of wine and with a bunch of beautiful people all getting along and watch the sunset. That's very Libra energy. So like when I'm talking about that cardinal force, I'm not talking about like, oh, Libra is just super forceful. That's not what I mean at all. It's more like just a, a charming kind of force, like a high kind of force, nice to meet you kind of force. Because it is the sign of, when I talk about how uh, Libra is ruled by Venus, okay, it's definitely the sign of relationships. In some uh, traditional forms of astrology, Libra is kind of like the sign of marriage because it's also the sign of contracts, okay? Uh, so it's, of course, this sign can be very strongly associated with your romantic relationships, 
but not just your romantic relationships. This can have anything to do with any kind of one-on-one -on -one relationship, okay? Uh, even if it's not even, it could even be the relationship between two, like, entities to organizations okay it's like if so here's this organization here this is my organization the other organization that you're sharing a contract with or or entity or company or whatever business would fall into the category of libra because they're the other one okay again it's like the scales a lot of times libra people especially libra risings will uh almost feel a little lack of a sense of self because it's the energy that is about sharing your energy with another person. Okay. It's that the balancing things out. The sign of Libra can also have a lot to do with justice and fairness. In fact, a, most a lawyers, most lawyers will actually have some kind of strong Libra energy in their natal chart. Maybe they just have Libra ruling their house of career, or maybe their sons in Leo, uh, Libra, or maybe they're a Libra rising. Um, it's a, it, because this is a sign that wants justice and wants fairness. In fact, a lot of Libra people will have a very, very difficult time with all the unjust in the world. Clearly, we're not living in a very uh, fair world. And that can be very difficult for this Libra energy. Okay, so first of all, how have you grown in these ways? Again, the motto is I balance. OK, the, the rulership is under Venus, which is all things beautiful and artistic and creative and relationships and harmony. It is the uh, the motto is I bound represented by the scales. OK, it's about justice and fairness. And it's that cardinal air sign. It is about intellect, but it's also, again, a very chill, laid back energy. So how have you grown in these ways? Because this is, the again, the, the completion of that cycle. But also, is there any of this Libra energy that you want to let go of? You know, maybe there's, maybe you've had a contract with somebody that needs to come to an end, even if it's a verbal contract. Maybe you're in a relationship that needs to come to an end. Again, not necessarily only talking about romantic relationships, talking about a best friend or again, some kind of a business partner or some, something like that. Uh, also, you know, maybe... Maybe you've been a little, a little too lazy, a little too laid back. Maybe you've been too busy watching the sunsets to be productive. Maybe it's time to let some of that th stuff go. Also, the sign of Libra can have a lot to do with vanity, okay? Um, I do notice a lot of Libras, especially sun uh, in Libra and Libra rising. Like if somebody's born with their sun in Libra and they're a Libra rising, I always catch these people like checking themselves out in, the, in a mirror. You know, when you're walking down the street, you can see your reflection in a window. I always see Libra people doing that. They, they would look, making sure they look all right. That kind of energy can come through with this, with Libra influence. And so if that's the case, maybe you've been a little too uh, concerned about beauty. This is really like the sign of beauty. Okay. And if you've been, if it's something you've been working on, making yourself more charming, making yourself more sociable, working on the relationship, this is a really good time to be honoring that. But again, also it's, it's difficult to think of. I was thinking about this myself. Well, geez, what do I want to let go of that's related to this sign of Libra? I'm not going to share all my little details of my own life, but it was a little bit difficult to figure out what I wanted to let go of that's related to this sign of Libra. But we all can benefit from doing that because the South Node is going to take some away anyway. Okay, so there's that. Now let's just go ahead and pull up the chart here. Start going through these things. All right, so for those of you who are new to my recordings, I work with Geocentric Western Astrology. And with that said, what we're looking at here is basically a snapshot of what we call the tropical zodiac at the time of this lunar eclipse. Uh, actually, really the time of this full moon. Okay, so with geocentric, we put Earth right here in the middle of this thing. These symbols right here that are kind of on the outer part of the wheel, the outer part of the wheel, those are the symbols for the celestial bodies, the planets. Okay, like here's Mars and here's Saturn and here's Venus and here's Neptune. Over here, we see the moon. The moon is easy to find in, in astrology because the glyph is just a crescent moon. And then here is the symbol for the sign of Libra. Now, this is what I'm talking about. Even the glyph for the sign of Libra, it's got a horizontal line, which is like the horizon. And then it's got that bump over that. That's like the sun setting on the horizon. That's that sign of Libra. 
Um, it's really interesting. I learned something uh, over the past few years. I didn't know this when I was growing up, but my last name, Wage, actually means it means the scales. It means Libra. And, and somebody pointed that out in a in a comment on one of my videos years ago, and I was like, "Wow, really? I didn't mean that." And so, yeah, that's kind of a neat thing to learn. Um, and and balance and fairness is very important to me. My North Node is in Libra, conjunct Pluto, and my Midheaven in the sign of Libra. So yes, I do have a heavy dose of this Libra energy in my chart. So <clears throat> first of all, this is what I'm talking about here. This right here is the South Node that's pretty darn close to the moon. What's going to happen is about, it's, it should be about 9.30 p.m. Pacific time, the moon will transit right over that South Node. Like here's the moon for this full moon at five degrees Libra. Here's the South Node at 15 degrees Libra. Well, as the day progresses, and keep in mind, I'm working with Pacific time here. You're going to have to do the calculations yourself depending on your own time zone. But the moon will move along and go over that south node. That south node is literally a drain point. That south node is what takes things away. And so as the moon transits over that south node, it can be very much about letting go of something. Again, that's related to the sign of Libra. And it's so incredibly beneficial to get familiar with your natal chart so you can see... Like, let's say this is on your Mercury and your Mercury rules over our, our mental function and our communication skills. And maybe, you know, you've been trying so hard to talk to a partner of any kind of, uh, you know, again, Mercury talking. Okay. You've been trying so hard to talk to this partner about this thing is not going on between you guys, whatever it is. And then all of a sudden that South Node, uh, sorry, the moon transits over the South Node and it's on your Mercury and you're just like, poof. I give up. I don't need to talk about it anymore. And I can, it just, it, it just takes it away. <laughs> okay. Now, but this is also, as I, I think I mentioned earlier, this, when somebody's born with this kind of placement, with the moon next to the South node, a lot of times they can deal with things like depression. I mean, first of all, the sign of the moon in the sign of Libra, when a lot of people, when people are born with their moon in Libra, unless there's something that's seriously counteracting this, a lot of times when people are born with their moon in Libra, <clears throat> it's really important to them that they they balance out their emotions. The moon rules our emotions. And so in the sign of Libra, it's like, okay, well, I got to make sense of these emotions. I don't want to, you know, tip over the scales too hard on this side or this side. I want it to be fair and balanced. Um, but then we've got the south node there, which is removing energies. And this, it can, that south node can, um, Sometimes it manifests as a little bit of a depression. Sometimes that south node is described to be very strongly associated with like past life memories. Okay. And a lot of times when people have past life memories, those lead into depression. It's like something that wasn't healed from a previous lifetime is still coming around to haunt you in this lifetime. It happens quite often, at least in my experience. Um, okay. So there's that. Now let's talk about over here, the sun going through the sign of Aries. Hallelujah. <laughs> By the time this video gets posted, it will be Aries season, uh, which means springtime. Aries is a cardinal fire sign. Talked about cardinal, the beginning of a new season. Aries is the beginning of springtime. And that's that cardinal fire energy that projects us forward into a new season. And I, for one, am very glad to say goodbye to wintertime. Uh, I just do not do, do well in the, in the cold weather. Um, but... We've got, this is going to be a wild Aries season. Like I said, we're going to have a total solar eclipse coming up on April 8th in the sign of Aries. That's going to be the North Node, conjunct the Sun, conjunct Chiron, with Mercury nearby. It's like, whoa, flood of Aries energy, aggressive Aries energy coming in, um, which could be great for some people. For some people, it could be giving them some really, really good energy. Certainly not for everybody. For those of us having a reverse nodal return this year, things are a little bit different, but it's very much um, just that sign of Aries in and of itself. It's the aggressive, it's ruled by Mars. It's a very strong, fiery, warrior-like energy. And we've got the sun going to the sign of Aries, and it's very strong because it's next to the north node, which the north node, that's where energy comes in. That's the entry point for celestial energy. That's the pump that brings the energy in. It's the dragon's head. And to talk about these notes for a minute, so the north node is Rahu. Some of you have heard these terms before, Rahu and Ketu. The north node is Rahu. The south node is Ketu. 
The North Node is the dragon's head. The South Node is the dragon's tail. Now, this dragon is ferocious. This dragon, I'll give you a little hint right now. So the, these nodes, in real traditional ancient astrology, these nodes are considered to be more powerful than the sun and the moon. In fact, they're said to be enemies of the sun and the moon. And there's some really, really fantastic mythology behind that. I think I'll probably go into that in my solar eclipse video, which will be coming out here soon over the next uh, week and a half or so. <clears throat> But there's so these nodes are said to rule over the journey of our soul. Okay, the journey of our soul from lifetime to lifetime. Like the south node, that's the past. The north node is where energy is coming in. Okay, that's it's sometimes the north node is referred to as our destiny, which I have used that term to describe the north the north node just to help people understand what it is. But it's not, when I use the word destiny, I'm not like, ooh, rainbows and butterflies with our destiny. It's it's actually a very aggressive energy. It's again, it's a dragon's head. And it's especially aggressive when it's coming to the sign of Aries. So if you have anything in your natal chart in the sign of Aries, you're there's a lot of energy coming in on that thing. Holy smokes. Uh, tendency for hot head. Um, it, very, very strong-willed kind of energy coming through here. But... I will say this, that this right here is Chiron, which is the wounded healer. Okay. Chiron is, <laughs> Chiron is, is like the influencer of those deep, deep wounds generally that are coming from early childhood development. Chiron is this very, uh, Chiron wants us to heal, but generally speaking, it's like the wounds that lay in our, in our subconscious stuff that we're not even aware of. But here we have the North Node, the pump that's bringing energy in next to the sun and approaching Chiron. It's like giving us this opportunity in that sign of self, the sign of Aries, the, the warrior, like, hey, come on, let's heal this stuff, especially like trauma wounds from when we were younger, that sort of thing. Uh, we've also got Mercury going through Aries, which Mercury, again, he's the ruler of our mental function and our communication skills, and he's all fired up going through the sign of Aries. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is like a very, very strong-willed person with all this Aries energy coming in. Basically, if anybody's born with the North Node fairly close to their sun, it doesn't even really matter what zodiac sign it's what zodiac sign it's in. It's going to be a strong person. Um, but this is it's very, very strong because it's the sign of Aries. Okay, then let's talk about all this Pisces energy we got going on here. So, first of all, let's start with Neptune, who's been in Pisces. I can't remember what, I think it's been 12 years that Neptune's been going through Pisces and still has about two more years to go, which Neptune is Pisces ruler. Neptune is what makes Pisces the mystic. Neptune is this very spiritual, mystical, flowy, watery, emotional energy, okay? And we're all receiving that with Neptune going through Pisces. Now, moreover, this right here is Venus, who's going through Pisces as well. This is Venus's favorite place to be. This is where Venus exalts because Pisces is this very uh, feminine, flowy, sensitive, compassionate energy. And Venus is the influencer of love and harmony. And she's feminine. And so she loves to be in the sign of Pisces. But what's really interesting is that here we have Saturn. So Saturn, he's a grumpy old man, okay? Saturn is the ruler of discipline and responsibility and rigidness, and he's literally like an old grumpy man. And Venus, they, Venus and Saturn can actually do well together because if you picture that grumpy old man and all of a sudden this beautiful lady comes walking up, Venus comes walking up and she authentically is being nice to that grumpy old man it's going to lift his spirits okay so it's kind of it, venus is in essence softening saturn's rigidness right now um she's already passed saturn so it's not quite as strong as it as it was say about uh hmm, probably five days before this new moon but it's still there it's still there venus is still like calm down saturn let's let's everybody get along especially in the sign of pisces now we've also got Mars in Pisces, which Mars, <clears throat> Mars is the aggressor. Mars is Aries ruler. As I'm talking about that sign of Aries, and Aries is that 
revved up energy, the cardinal fire sign that is Aries is like that because Mars is Aries ruler. Mars is when we think about a, 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 an ignition for a muscle car, like do, 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 it's starting up. That's very Mars energy, or like the a huge dude that's just like pumping iron at the gym. That's very Mars energy. Mars, in fact, rules our muscles and our adrenal glands. And Mars in Pisces, this is not a normal place. I mean, I shouldn't say it's not a normal place. It's just not Mars's strong point in the sign of Pisces. I personally love this placement. Um, for many of you who I've given reading to, my friends who have their Mar Mars and Pisces, you see me get excited about it. I love Mars and Pisces because it's like these people are very, they put things into action with movement and flow to them. And a lot of times they can be really good dancers or sometimes Mars and Pisces people strangely can even be good at the martial arts because Pisces can be kind of this artistic or flowy type of energy and Mars the martial arts actually means Mars war arts. Okay. It's like the art of war. And so Mars and Pisces people can be kind of a little more flowy with their, with their martial arts and their form. Um, and a lot of times they'll project themselves. Like and they're just like flowy people. And certainly not all of them, but most of them uh, who are born with Mars and Pisces. So anyway, I love Mars and Pisces, but Mars probably doesn't love to be Pisces so much. Mars is like, I need to go fast. And Pisces is like, calm down, ride the waves, man. So, so there's that a lot of this very mystical, spiritual Piscean energy, but also a lot of aggressive energy going on. And then that full moon conjunct the South node. I would honestly, if you're somebody who deals with, you know, even mild depression, I would just be very mindful about What's what you're experiencing in the the days and hours of this transit, um, because it, it it can trigger that sort of thing. Okay, now let's jump on over here and talk about Jupiter conjunct Uranus in Taurus. So, oh, let's start with Uranus first. So Uranus, zappy, electrical. Uh, Uranus is like sticking your finger into a, a plug, you know, or you plug stuff in. This is you're gonna get zapped. That's Uranus energy. Uranus rules over things like electricity and, and all of our electronic devices and uh, things like the internet. Uranus is very revolutionary and rebellious energy. And meanwhile, the sign of Taurus is like slow, steady, calm, strong. The sign of Taurus is the bull, it's strong, but it's strong because it knows how to hold itself still, okay? It's it's not necessarily a sign that uh, really wants Uranus electrocuting it by any means, but it's also creating some very, very revolutionary changes in the world. In fact, the sign of Taurus rules over uh, our, our, agricultural, our, our agricultural systems, like food that's growing out of the ground. Also, the uh, sign of Taurus rules over things like farm animals. Um, for those of you who eat, you know, meat and that sort of thing, that sign of Taurus, it, it's again, it's the bull, it's it's the cow, uh, but it also rules over the, you know, carrots and th things that are growing out of the ground. And so we're experiencing some very, very, s many of them not so good revolutionary changes involving our, our agricultural systems, all sorts of, you know, changes and um, <clears throat> They're getting technological with the genetic modifications and all sorts of weird things, things like that. Also, the sign of Taurus rules over money. We're experiencing all kinds of changes involving our financial systems. Everything's going electronic. Everything. Uh, it's just wild to observe, especially knowing what Uranus is doing in the sign of Taurus. Uh, but what's happening here is Jupiter is getting closer and closer and closer to Uranus. They're going to go exactly conjunct on April 20th. That's a big deal. Because what Uranus, uh, sorry, what Jupiter does, anything Jupiter touches, he wants to expand it. That's what he does. He's the expander. He's a great benefic, brings a lot and abundance of wisdom and philosophy and all sorts of wonderful things. Jupiter is very charitable, uh, but it's creeping up on Uranus in the sign that rules over our finances and our, our agricultural system. So really big changes going on there really, in my opinion, especially over the next couple of years, uh, because 
is you're on a, it's the end of that sign of Taurus. Things are, I think it's getting really, really, really interesting. But also since Jupiter is approaching Uranus, it's just a big deal. It's a very big deal. Okay, now uh, let's jump on down here to Pluto going through Aquarius. We're just going to briefly touch on this since we've talked so much about it already. So Pluto, the bringer of powerful transformation. Pluto is Pluto is Hades in Greek mythology. Pluto is the ruler of the underworld. Pluto is what exposes us to the dark side of life, the shadow side, the, the scary stuff, the spiders, the, you know, the stuff that's, Pluto is, is a very kind of, again, underworld type of energy. Don't get me wrong. We love Pluto. We need Pluto. He's the, he's the ruler of power. But Pluto doesn't just go handing out power for free to everybody. Pluto says, no, you have to go through the you have to go through the death and rebirth process. You have to flush out what's no longer working for you so that you can make room for new powerful beginnings. That's what Pluto, how Pluto works. Okay, so he's just entering into the sign of Aquarius. Basically, he's, as I've mentioned so many times, he's going to have to retrograde back into Capricorn one more time this year, uh, which was going to be right around the time of the elections. That's going to be very, very interesting stuff going on there. I think that a lot of people are going to I think it's going to be a really, really weird year as far as the elections go. I feel like a lot of people are giving up on the so-called system. I think a lot of people are, well, let's get into this. So the sign of Aquarius is really the sign of hu humanitarianism. It's a sign of the people for the people versus over here, Capricorn is more like government and authority. Aquarius is more like the people, okay? And Pluto is going through that basically... Again, Pluto has to move back into Capricorn one more time later on this year, but then basically at the end of November of this year, then Pluto's in the sign of Aquarius for the next 20 years, all the way to 2044. And I think Pluto is bringing the very powerful transformational process to humanity. And not only that, but I think there's also going to be some sort of a connection with technology that happens there as well. The sign of Aquarius is very strongly associated with things like inventions and science and yeah, things that are technological, I think we're about to see over these next 20 years, a lot of very, it's like things very well could crumble to a certain degree, but then something more powerful kind of be built up over that. Okay, I think I covered everything I wanted to in the chart, and I hope you guys are following along well enough here. Now let's talk about body parts. So the sign of Libra, really rules the kidneys. I mean, the sign of, it rules the lumbar, kind of rules over the buttocks as well, but really the kidneys is what I would be paying a little extra attention to. Um, for the kidneys, there's something called golden rod. Golden rod in a tincture form could be really good for kidneys, but also something really simple that we can all have access to, especially if you grow your own. Now is springtime, it's a really good time to start planting your little seeds, uh, is parsley parsley just eating parsley but also you could get parsley and simmer it in in hot water for an hour or so and drink that water parsley is so good for the kidneys it basically could like regenerate the the tissue in the kidneys um another one i really like taking activated charcoal on just a regular basis i take it at least a few times a week and i know that also helps to keep the kidney uh, not just the kidneys helps activated charcoal helps keep the digestive digestive system or tracked, like cleaned out. The activated charcoal just pulls gunk out, that sort of thing. Um, also, if for people who are dealing with, say, kidney stones, there's something called chonsa piedra, which actually means the stone pressure. Chonsa piedra could be great for the kidneys. Um, I mean, overall, it's just, I'm not a doctor and I'm not trying to offer any kind of medical advice or opinion. This is all stuff that you can look into yourself if you so desire. There's a million different ways to help to take care of our kidneys. Um, but again, also lumbar. For those of you, especially my generation, my uh, basically between 1972 and 1984, are those of us are born with Pluto in the sign of Libra. So Pluto is again, the ruler of the underworld. Pluto can definitely influence some toxicity. Again, I don't mean to make Pluto, because I absolutely love Pluto. I, and Pluto is like one of the most fascinating energies for me to, to study, um, but it can be fairly toxic. Uh, so those of us with Pluto and Lib Libra, especially like if you have your son in Libra and you were born between 1972 and 1984, 
there can be a tendency for toxicity in the kidneys. Um, and again, so that the parsley and the golden rod, I mean, there's so many other things we could do to take care of our kidneys, but <clears throat> uh, can, a lot of us are experiencing lumbar pain at this point in our life. And for lumbar pain, I like royal fern. Royal fern could be great for any kind of lumbar pain. Again, I'm not a doctor and I'm not trying to offer any kind of medical advice. These are just things that I've experienced for myself and learned through all my wonderful teachers uh, through uh, schools of nutrition and medical astrology, the Academy for Astrological Medicine. Obviously, I learned most of my medical astrology stuff from that. But again, um, just, you know, you might want to check in with your healthcare practitioner before dabbling in at any of these things. Okay, so what else are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about gemstones. So the sign of Libra, the dedicated zodiacal birthstone is opal. So I put my opal on today. Opal is absolutely beautiful. I wish I could get the camera to pick that up better. Uh, thank you. This is from my grandmother. Thank you, grandma. Um, opal is really good. Oh, that's what I was also going to mention. Balancing stuff out in the body. In fact, the sign of Libra rules over all the balances in the body. We're talking about like hormone levels. Um, in fact, Libra also rules over the ovaries. Uh, Libra also rules over like the, the balance, you know, pH balances in the body. And opal is said to help balance those things out, balance out our hormones. Black opal can be really good too. Black opal is a little more protective than white opal. Um, so obviously not everybody's got an opal laying around, but if you do, you might want to consider working with the opal for this lunar transit. But another one I wanted to mention is rose quartz. I actually, this is like a, a massage tool that I've been using. I just, this end of this winter, man, it just, my immune system went down. I take very good care of myself. I take all kinds of immune boosters and vitamins, and, but I think it's, I, somebody who is born, I'm born literally the day before spring begins. I'm born at the very last day of winter. And with that said, I just don't have a very strong constitution because I'm born at the end of the cycle. Like if you picture the Zodiac, Aaron's born right at the very end of it before it all starts up again. And so my body just tends to shut down, unfortunately, right around my birthday time when it's the end of winter. So I've just been using this to help keep, you know, rubbing out my lymph and that sort of thing. But rose quartz is a beautiful stone. It's not one that I pull out very often, but it is very, very common. I mean, any crystal shop you go into, you're going to be able to find rose quartz. And, it, you know, even just a tiny little piece, generally speaking, it's not very expensive. It's a very affordable stone. And it's a very protective stone. One of the reasons I love rose quartz so much, and I'm not, I don't, I, in fact, it's funny that I'm wearing a pink sweater today because I almost ever, never, ever wear pink. Even when I was a little girl, I never wanted to wear pink. Uh, I would never like decorate my house with pink stuff. Um, and I think that's why I don't have a lot of rose quartz stuff just because it's, it's not really my favorite color. Uh, but it's very soothing. It's very relaxing. It's also protective and it's an amplifier. That's uh, Rose Quartz is pretty unbelievable. I mean, it really is. You can help support the immune system. It's, uh, you know, <clears throat> there's been studies done where if you take somebody and put them in a, in a room that's painted all red, they're going to be kind of overstimulated and their brain, they could even lead, lead into frustrations. You put them in a room that's, uh, you know, this light pink color, it's a soothing, calming kind of energy that they experience from that. And again, it is protective, but also amplifying at the same time. Another one I want to mention here is black tourmaline, one of my all time favorite protective stones. Black tourmaline resonates very well with the sign of Libra. And part of the reason I wanted to pull this out is because it's, it is an eclipse. It, this is a very, very protective stone. And in my opinion, it is definitely a good idea to be working with some kind of protective stone during any kind of an eclipse, solar eclipse, lunar eclipse, whatever it is. Kyanite is also another good one. Um, blue kyanite or black kyanite uh, could be very, very protective and also resonate well with the sign of Libra. This is just like my old reliable here. I've had this stone for so many years now and I absolutely love it. Okay, so let's see what else do we want to mention here. You know, with these eclipses, I really, it is, in my very strong opinion, not the most ideal, um, not the most ideal time to be outside just fully exposing ourselves to the astrological forces. Um, there's certain traditions that would go out when we have an eclipse and they would smash pots, the Hopi would smash like ceramic pots. And that was to help 
you know, some people would say that they were smashing the pots to scare the dragon energy away because eclipses are dragon energy. It's because the north and south node, the dragon's head and the dragon's tail. But it's also said that was the initial, um, well, that's the way it was described to me. But then later on, through reading many books, um, I understand that they were smashing the pots because it was more... Like we know that the eclipse is going to smash something anyway. I don't want it to smash the bones of my body or something in my environment. So I'm going to smash this pot instead. So it breaks that cycle, breaks that, you know, tendency for something else to, to be broken around me or in me or that sort of thing. Um, eclipses are just extremely powerful. Definitely not the most ideal time to be out harvesting spring water. I would say at least six days before or six days after the eclipse. I mean, honestly, I would... Kind of, unless you're somebody who relies on getting your own spring water, I would wait till at least six days after the eclipse. But if you can, because we have this eclipse on March 25th and then another, uh, the solar eclipse on March 8th, between those, that time frame, between March 25th and April 8th, I wouldn't be out harvesting spring water or, you know, harvesting, you know, stuff off of trees or anything like that. Um, of course, you know, if you got a lemon tree, I'm not saying you shouldn't be out there picking lemons on it because there was an eclipse a few days ago, but just be mindful about these things because it's eclipse. Basically, it's we, it's like a, we're cut off. We're getting a little cut off from our source energy with those luminaries. OK, so it's almost like we're cut off momentarily from those things. And so it's just a good idea to keep ourselves a little bit protected. Okay, so I think I will leave that there. If you would like to schedule an astrology reading, please visit erinwageastrology.com. I do hope to hear from some of you. And until next time, namaste to all of you.